First, I mean, it's, just, it's an honor to be here, um, to be in this position. You know, after spending eight years uh, from 2010 to 2017, uh, those are eight great years, uh, not just on the field but off the field, you know, for my family. Uh, younger son essentially grew up here. I mean, he was here first through ninth grade uh, before we moved to him, and then uh, older son finished his junior and senior year here and then went to App, graduated from here. So, you know, certainly App is, is a special place to us as a family. Um, but just uh, to be back with with guys that were on staff at that time, you know, in this business, it's, it's always more special to work with people that you know and trust. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's fun to be back from that standpoint as well. David Ware, 24-7 Sports. Um, Scott, you... As you said, you were you were at App for a long time here through the FBS transition. Then you went and took over as coordinator at, at Georgia Southern. Um, you know you've been away for a few seasons. Now you've come back. As you've arrived back, you know what the the vibe, the culture, all those things were when you left. How do things compare? Maybe what, what are some of the differences you've noticed? Uh, you know the 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 vibe and the culture is very similar. You know the players are are very much. Uh, still what we would consider and always talked about when I was here the first time, an app guy that kind of fits the mold of, of what we look for uh, in a player, but then also in a person as a student. And, and that's been consistent. You know, it didn't change. It didn't drop off. It didn't vary. So uh, that's been that's been consistent. You know, certainly this building's an added feature, you know, because it was talked about and it was in the, the infant stages back then um, with pictures and drawings and renderings. But now to to be able to be in it and and feel the life that it gives to the program, uh, you know, it's got a, as we call it, it's got that bling to it, which helps in recruiting. Um, you know, because this is an arms race; it doesn't matter what level you're playing at, you got to keep up an arms race. And I think they've done a really good job here. Uh, this building definitely, you know, keeps you relevant uh, when you start recruiting against you know other people out there. So, um, but the the culture piece, I, I think, is still very, very similar and intact to what, uh, you know, I was accustomed to that first time. Um, Frank Ponce came back into a, a coaching staff that was pretty much similar to what it was in 2021 when he was here. You had more turnover that you had to deal with. Talk a little bit about that process of going through constructing your defensive staff, um, you know, the decision to uh, – the decisions that you were made along the way to bring guys in. What were the criteria? What were the priorities for you as you considered who you needed to have based on where you want to go with the defense here? Yeah, the uh, the, the biggest thing in this whole thing is uh, – uh, because it's a bottom line business, you know, and it's a, it's a production business. I mean, if, if you're not productive and if you're not meeting bottom line, then, then changes, you know, get made from the top down. And so anytime you're in a situation like this, uh, from a coordinator standpoint, you want guys in your foxhole that, that have been in your foxhole. And um, sometimes it means making tough decisions, you know, with guys. And those are always the hardest decisions to make because, you know, being a coach for 32 years, this, it affects wives and kids and families and things like that. So uh, I am sensitive to, to that standpoint, you know, when tough decisions, you know, kind of had to be made. But um, at the end of the day, just surrounding myself and guys sitting around that table that, that I knew um, either from coaching with him in the past or like in AJ's situation, recruited him out of high school, coached him his whole career here, et cetera. Um, and then even AJ and I crossed paths since he left and since I left. Um, you know, he actually came to visit and spent some time with me at Georgia Southern when he was playing and shared some ideas and things like that. So he and I have always stayed very close. And that was part of the, the thing that, that really kind of came into play when I you know, wanted to get him back on staff. But... You know, it's always tough. It's never an easy deal, you know, when you have to, to deal with changes. But at the end of the day, you know, it's just, uh, you know, filling all those seats up with guys that's, that's been in, in battle with you and you know exactly what you're getting and, and how you're going to get it is really kind of what comes down to, to some of those decisions. As you head into spring ball on Monday um, and you and the staff have been working on practice plans and, and priorities and, and really getting focused on the same page, what are the things that are the biggest priorities? What are you hoping that, that you're going to accomplish first and foremost out of camp? The biggest thing is just uh, kind of establishing the standards and what the standards are and, and making sure that the players <clears throat> understand totally that the standard is always going to be the standard and it can never be compromised. It can never be uh, adjusted or, or minimized in, in anything of that fashion, which is, you know, you, you got to be able to play fast and 
you got to be able to play physical and violent. You got to be solid, <clears throat> solid and sound. Uh, you know, so when I, my very first meeting with the players, I presented what our philosophy would be and made sure they understood these are non-negotiables. These are the things that we have to do to have a chance to win. And if we don't do them, we don't have a chance to win games. And that's stopping the run, staying on top, which is not giving up cheap, cheap balls. The easiest way to score is through the air and over the top. So stop and run, staying on top, matching the numbers. It's, it's a chess match game on every snap, but we're not out there coaching them on game day. They have to be equipped with the tools to match the formations into the boundary, the shifts, the motions, the empties, the implosions, the explosions, all of that type of stuff. You know, it's uh, it's not just line up with 11 guys in the box and see who can bloody each other's nose anymore. It's more of a basketball on grass, fast break mentality. And so you got to be able to match those numbers. And then, uh, and then the last is you got to create turnovers. To me, uh, philosophically, I think that's probably the number one stat possibly uh, that determines the outcome of a game is the turnover margin. And so the guys will be uh, coached, they'll be drilled, they'll be programmed uh, that the, the catchphrase is the ball's the issue. And so every snap of defense is to, number one, not let them score. Number two, take the ball away on every single snap. And the more times we can do that, then the better chance we set our offense up. The next thing was the identity. So they, they understand what the philosophy is, and then they also understand what the identity is. And the identity is what you want people to say about you. How do you want to be identified as a defensive unit? And that's first and foremost that we play extremely fast, uh, whether it's people in the stands, whether it's people flip on ESPN and watch a game, uh, or opposing coaches when it comes down to scouting and them putting their game plan, the first thing you want them to say is, holy cow, these dudes play fast. They're flying to the freaking football. Uh, but not just playing fast. Second thing is playing violent and playing physical. And that's the, that's the name of the game as far as taking the ball away. Uh, you can teach all kind of techniques and rips and pulls and punch and all that. But at the end of the day, when you violently throw your body into somebody else's, uh, balls tend to come out. So they'll play fast or play physical. Uh, but third is to play smart. And that's twofold. Uh, not beating yourself with mental errors. Uh, not uh, making foolish penalties. There's nothing worse than to make a great third down stop and then get that 15-yard flag for excessive whatever after the play. Whether it's talking, celebration, pushing, all that type of nonsense. Stuff that we can control. So playing fast, playing physical and violent, playing smart and then the last thing is having fun doing it because these guys work year round you know i told them there's there's only 12 promise opportunities so what are you doing with those other 353 days at the end of the day most of those 353 are tied up whether it's in the weight room whether it's running on the field whether it's in a film session with us whatever we're allowed to do within ncaa rules you know we're going to do you know from an install standpoint a walkthrough standpoint uh meetings whatever it may be you know, so it's a, it's a year-round obligation for them. So we need to go out and we need to have fun. The reason we all coach the game is because we love it. The reason they play it is because they love it. So practice should be fun. Games should be fun. We should enjoy each other uh, from that standpoint. So those are the things that, that I presented to them day one, the very first time I talked to all of them sitting right here in this room, was what our philosophy is and them understanding that's non-negotiable. And then what our identity is, that's what you want people to say about you. Chris Womack, WLOS. Chris. Uh, coming from a place like Army where you have such strict parameters with the players that you're dealing with, uh, what kind of growth do you undergo as a coach and what kind of lessons do you learn dealing uh, with a team like Army? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a unique experience because it was the first time I've spent some time at military schools, you know, at Georgia Military and at Riverside Military Academy and things of that nature, but not to the extent of the United States Military Academy. Uh, those guys were a pleasure. I mean, they're they're built different. They're wired different. I mean, they are uh, – I learned very quickly. They're not thinking about the next 30 minutes or the next two hours or the next month. They're thinking 14, 15, 20 years down the road, and they're very goal-driven and that, that type of deal. So um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, coaching those guys, never had to worry about them missing a beat, whether it was a meeting or a tutoring session or class or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, and, and they love the game. I mean, they, they do know. I mean, they made a, a bigger commitment than just football, you know, when they signed up to do that. Um, but but they were a pleasure to coach. And, and from a coaching standpoint, I feel 
privileged and blessed to have had that one, you know, that one year spending there, um, and wasn't looking for a job. You know, I mean, I was I was very happy. Um, my wife loved it. Um, the Army Navy game was second to none. I'd already been told when I got hired, get ready. You're gonna tear up. You're gonna cold chills. I mean, it's probably the closest you'll experience to the Super Bowl, and it, it it didn't let me down. That's for sure. So, very fortunate, very blessed, and and it was a it was a great experience. I'm glad I glad I went that path for one year. With your background in the secondary, I, I would imagine this is among the toughest times to coach the secondary with the advent of, of targeting and mobile quarterbacks and whatnot. Uh, just, just how, how do you address the secondary and, and allow them to play violent and physical, as you said, while not giving up a, a targeting penalty, et cetera? Yeah, I, I learned not to get overly frustrated because uh, if you try to tame them down, you're not going to be very good. You just you let them play. And and hopefully now with the replay and the video and they can come back and, you know, because those guys have to make split-second judgment calls, and I know it's hard. I would not want to have to make them. Uh, defensively, it gets frustrating sometimes, you know, when it doesn't go your way. But, you know, I get it. But at the end of the day, it's, you can't pull back on them and say, well, don't go quite as hard because you may get targeting. Because then you put that fear in the back of their mind and they're not going to cut loose. So. Um, it's just part of the game that we have to deal with. But the way the game has changed with all these mobile quarterbacks and and things like that, um, it, it does add an added dimension. And that's why you see so many different sub packages, you know, with a fifth DB or a sixth DB and maybe only two off, uh, two defensive linemen. And, you know, I mean, you have, to, you have to match your personnel with their personnel. And so um, that does make it more challenging with the kind of the way the games become nowadays, yeah. Scott, you may have touched on this before a little bit, but as the Sun Belt has grown and gotten better, has that changed at all, either the prototype or some of the things you put a premium on defensively for how that kind of mixes with what you know App State now is facing compared to what it faced um, when you were here the first time? Yeah, um, yeah, it certainly changed a bunch with the new teams coming in the league. Still for us, philosophically, we want guys that are fast and sudden and twitchy and uh, explosive. Um, before you might could have gotten away with some of the smaller body types. You know, now you, you have to look for a little bit bigger body type, especially up front defensive line wise, um, than maybe what we were four or five years ago. Uh, but you still have to be, especially for the style of our three four defense is is there's a premium on guys that are sudden and fast and explosive and um, so still would give up an inch or two if you had to to get a guy that was was a quicker moving guy um, but you, you you still you have to understand I mean if he's 510 defensive end and that guy's six five on the other side there's a length factor that's not going to go your weight unless you beat him with speed every time so certainly looking for a little bit taller and longer guys up front and even in the linebacker core um, and, and then even you know from a corner standpoint, you know it's, it's hard to have a room full of five nine guys. You know, there's places for five nine guys, but then there's also places for the the six one DB types. You know because of some of the sizes of the wideouts that you'll face you know throughout the league now. So finding that happy mixture, but trying to never compromise the speed, the twist, the sudden, the explosive movements. You know especially in short areas, that's always going to be a, a premium that we try to identify in recruiting. You've touched on your relationship with AJ from coaching him or just maintaining that relationship even when you weren't. Were there things you saw in him that you thought would develop into some coaching mentalities that you kind of picked up on, especially coming here with maybe a position that he, you know, he didn't play and maybe isn't quite as familiar with? Or just what are some of the traits that you saw in him that kind of encouraged you about his coaching potential? Yeah, the one, recruiting him out of high school is extremely mature. You know, he was a mid-year grad, so he came in early and went through all of the spring and winter workouts. Uh, as opposed to being in spring semester as a senior year in high school. So he got that early jump. So we got, you know, a lot of time together going into this freshman year. And I think that's what helped lead him to being a, uh, as big a contributor he w as he was uh, as a true freshman. But just really, really mature. Um, football IQ was extremely high. I mean, when stuff started coming at him fast from an install playbook standpoint, never flinched. He was able to absorb it. Um, was a student of the game. A lot of times I'd walk by the meeting room and 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 he and a couple other safeties were, were sitting in there and, and watching film on their own. And and so things like that just made an impression. And then after football, you know, just, 
you know, and it, I learned this from, from Coach Moore. I mean, it's, it's a people business, and so getting close to those players, still have great relationships with probably 70, 80% of the guys that, that I did coach, you know, not just him, but a lot of guys that I've crossed paths with. And so um, from a from a coaching position standpoint, he actually did play the position in some of our sub packages. You know, we would have a nickel package and we would slide him down to that, what we call the anchor, but it became a nickel. All it is is play on words, but, and bring in a third safety. So he does have experience playing that position and, and really, being a safety, I challenge him. I tell him every day. I told him this yesterday after workouts. I said, "You are the quarterbacks of this defense, and you run it." All right on game day, I'll make calls, but out there, formations are going to change. You're going to see a, a, a formation or a motion that we haven't practiced, and you got to be able to get into your toolbox and run the defense. You got to make split second decisions, and you do that from the neck up. Yeah, we got to be able to run. We got to tackle. We got to do this and that. But from the neck up is a big part of my teaching and my equipping them. And that was something AJ was always able to handle. And it didn't matter if he was at safety or down at that, that nickel position or whatever it was. So was just very comfortable with his knowledge of the game and knew that, you know, just the way he was driven as a player, I didn't think it would be any different as a coach, even though we may not have coached together, to, you know, up until now.